Good evening and welcome back to Booked for the Night. I'm Melissa Phillips and tonight I'm reading chapters 4 through 6 of The Princess and the Goblin by George MacDonald. Enjoy. Chapter 4. What the Nurse Thought of It Why, where can you have been, Princess? asked the nurse, taking her in her arms. It's very unkind of you to hide away so long. I began to be afraid. Here she checked herself. What were you afraid of, nursey? asked the princess. Never mind, she answered. Perhaps I will tell you another day. Now, tell me where you have been. I've been up a long way to see my very great, huge, old grandmother, said the princess. What do you mean by that? asked the nurse, who thought she was making fun. I mean that I've been a long way up and up to see my grandmother. Ah, nursey, you don't know what a beautiful mother of grandmothers I've got upstairs. She is such an old lady, with such lovely white hair, as white as my silver cup. Now, when I think of it, I think her hair must be silver. What nonsense you are talking, princess, said the nurse. I'm not talking nonsense, returned Irene, rather offended. I will tell you all about her. She's much taller than you and much prettier. Oh, I dare say, remarked the nurse. And she lives upon pigeon's eggs. Most likely, said the nurse. And she sits in an empty room, spin spinning all day long. Not a doubt of it, said the nurse. And she keeps her crown in her bedroom. Of course, quite the proper place to keep her crown in. She wears it in bed, I'll be bound. She didn't say that, and I don't think she does. That wouldn't be comfortable, would it? I don't think my papa wears his crown for a nightcap. Does he, nursey? I never asked him. I dare say he does. And she's been there ever since I came here, ever so many years. Anybody could have told you that, said the nurse, who did not believe a word Irene was saying. Why didn't you tell me then? There was no necessity. You could make it all up for yourself. You don't believe me then, exclaimed the princess, astonished and angry as well she might be. Did you expect me to believe you, princess? asked the nurse coldly. I know princesses are in the habit of telling make-believes, but you are the first I ever heard of who expected to have them believed, she added, seeing that the child was strangely in earnest. The princess burst into tears. Well, I must say, remarked the nurse, now thoroughly vexed with her for crying. It is not all becoming in a princess to tell stories and expect to be believed just because she is a princess. But it's quite true, I tell you, nursey. You've dreamt it then, child. No, I didn't dream it. I went upstairs and I lost myself. And if I hadn't, hadn't found that beautiful lady, I should never have found myself. Oh, I dare say. Well, you just come up with me and see if I'm not telling the truth. Indeed, I have other work to do. It's your dinner time and I won't have any more such nonsense. The princess wiped her eyes and her face grew so hot that they were soon quite dry. She sat down to her dinner but ate next to nothing. Not to be believed does not at all agree with princesses, for a real princess cannot tell a lie. So all the afternoon she did not speak a word. Only when the nurse spoke to her, she answered, for a real princess is never rude, even when she is rightly offended. Of course the nurse was not comfortable in her mind, not that she suspected the least truth in Irene's story, but she loved Irene dearly and was vexed with her for having been cross to her. She thought her crossness was the cause of the princess's unhappiness, and had no idea that Irene was really and deeply hurting, hurt at not being believed. But as it became more and more plain during the evening in every motion and look, that although she tried to amuse herself with her toys, her heart was too vexed and troubled to enjoy them. Her nurse's discomfort grew and grew. When bedtime came, she undressed and laid her down, but the child, instead of holding up her little face to be kissed, turned away from her and lay still. Then Nursie's heart gave way altogether, and she began to cry. At the sound of her first sob, the princess turned again and held her face to kiss her as usual. 
but the nurse had her handkerchief to her eyes and did not see the movement. Nursey, said the princess, why won't you believe me? Because I can't believe you, said the nurse, getting angry again. Ah, then you can't help it, said Irene, and I will not be vexed with you any more. I will give you a kiss and go to sleep. You little angel, cried the nurse and caught her out of bed and walked about the room with her in her arms, kissing and hugging her. You will let me take you to see my dear old great big grandmother, won't you? said the princess as she laid her down again. And you won't say I'm ugly any more, will you, princess? Nursey, I never said you were ugly. What can you mean? Well, if you didn't say it, you meant it. Indeed, I never did. You said I wasn't so pr pretty as that. As my beautiful grandmother. Yes, I did say that, and I say it again, for it's quite true. Then I do think you are unkind, said the nurse, and put her handkerchief to her eyes again. Mercy, dear, everybody can't be as beautiful as every other body, you know. You are very nice looking, but if you had been as beautiful as my grandmother... Bother your grandmother, said the nurse. Nurse, that's very rude. You are not fit to be spoken to till you can behave better. The princess turned away once more, and again the nurse was ashamed of herself. I am sure I beg your pardon, princess, she said, though still in an offended tone. But the princess let the tone pass and heeded only the words. You won't say it again, I am sure, she answered, once more turning toward her nurse. I was only going to say that if you had been twice as nice looking as you are, some king or other would have married you, and then what would have become of me? You are an angel, repeated the nurse again, embracing her. Now, insisted Irene, you will come and see my grandmother, won't you? I will go with you anywhere you like, my cherub, she answered. And in two minutes, the weary little princess was fast asleep. Chapter 5 The Princess Lets Well Alone When she woke the next morning, the first thing the princess heard was the rain still falling. Indeed, this day was so like the last that it would have been difficult to tell what the use of it was. The first thing she thought of, however, was not the rain, but the lady in the tower, and the first question that occupied her thoughts was whether she should not ask the nurse to fulfill her promise this very morning and go with her to find her grandmother as soon as she had had her breakfast. But she came to the conclusion that perhaps the lady would not be pleased if she took anyone to see her without first asking leave especially as if it was pretty evident, seeing she lived on pigeon's eggs and cooked them herself, that she did not want the household to know she was there. So the princess resolved to take the first opportunity of running up alone and asking whether she might bring her nurse. She believed the fact that she could not otherwise convince her nursey that she was telling the truth would have much weight with her grandmother. The princess and her nurse were the best of friends all dressing time, and the princess, in consequence, ate an enormous little breakfast. I wonder, Ludy, that was her pet name for her nurse, what pigeon's eggs taste like, she said, as she was eating her egg, not quite a common one, for they always picked out the pinky ones for her. We'll get you a pigeon's egg, and you shall judge for yourself, said the nurse. Oh, no, no, returned Irene, suddenly reflecting they might disturb the old lady in getting it, and that even if they did not, she would have one less in consequence. What a strange creature you are, said the nurse, first to want a thing and then to refuse it. But she did not say it crossly, and the princess never minded any remarks that were not unfriendly. Well, you see, Ludie, there are reasons, she returned, and said no more, for she did not want to bring up the subject of their former strife, lest her nurse should offer to go before she had had her grandmother's permission to bring her. Of course, she could refuse to take her, but then she would believe her less than ever. Now the nurse, as she said herself afterward, could not be every moment in the room, and as never before yesterday had the princess given her the smallest reason for anxiety, it had not yet come into her head to watch her more closely. 
So she soon gave her a chance, and the very first that offered, Irene was off and up the stairs again. This day's adventure, however, did not turn out like yesterday's, although it began like it, and indeed today is very seldom like yesterday, if people would note the differences, even when it rains. The princess ran through the passage after passage and could not find the stair of the tower. My own suspicion is that she had not gone up high enough and was searching on the second instead of the third floor. When she turned to go back, she failed equally in her search after the stair. She was lost once more. Something made it even, more, even worse to bear this time, and it was no wonder that she cried again. Suddenly it occurred to her that it was after having cried before that she found her grandmother's stare. She got up at once, wiped her eyes, and started upon a fresh quest. This time, although she did not find what she hoped, she found what was next best. She did not come on a stair that went up, but she came upon one that went down. It was evidently not the stair she had come up. Yet it was a good deal better than none, so down she went and was singing merrily before she reached the bottom. There, to her surprise, she found herself in the kitchen. Although she was not allowed to go there alone, her nurse had often taken her, and she was a great favorite with the servants. So there was a general rush at her the moment she appeared, for everyone wanted to have her, and the report of where she was soon reached the nurse's ears. She came at once to fetch her, but she never suspected how she had got there, and the princess kept it to herself. Her failure to find the old lady not only disappointed the princess, but also made her very thoughtful. Sometimes she came almost to the nurse's opinion that she had dreamed all about her, but that fancy never lasted very long. She wondered much whether she would ever see her again, and thought it very sad not to have been able to find her when she particularly wanted her. She resolved to say nothing more to her nurse on the subject, seeing it was so little in her power to prove her words. Chapter 6 The Little Miner The next day the great cloud still hung over the mountain, and the rain poured like water from a full sponge. The princess was very fond of being outdoors, and she nearly cried when she saw that the weather was no better. But the mist was not of such a dark, dingy gray. There was light in it, and as the hours went on, it grew brighter and brighter, until it was almost too brilliant to look at. And late in the afternoon, the sun broke out so gloriously that Irene clapped her hands, crying, See, see, Ludy, the sun has had its face washed. Look how bright he is. Do get my hat, and let us go out for a walk. Oh dear, oh dear, how happy I am! Ludie was very glad to please the princess. She got her hat and cloak, and they set out together for a walk up the mountain, for the road was so hard and steep that the water could not rest upon it, and it was always dry enough for walking a few minutes after the rain ceased. The clouds are rolling away in broken pieces, like great over-woolly sheep, whose wool the sun had bleached till it was almost too white for the eyes to bear. Between them, the sky shone with a deeper and purer blue because of the rain. The trees on the roadside were hung all over with drops, which sparkled in the sun like jewels. The only things that were no brighter for the rain were the brooks that ran down the mountain. They had changed from the clearness of crystal to a muddy brown, but what they lost in color they gained in sound, or at least in noise, for a brook when it is swollen is not so musical as before. But Irene was in raptures with the great brown streams tumbling down everywhere, and Ludy shared in her delight, for she too had been confined to the house for three days. At length, Ludy observed that the sun was getting low and said it was time to be going back. She made the remark again and again, but every time the princess begged her to go on just a little farther and a little farther, reminding her that it was much easier to go downhill, and saying that when they did turn, they would be at home in a moment. So on and on they did go, now to look at a group of ferns who, over whose tops the stream was pouring in a watery arch, now to pick a shining stone from a rock by the wayside, now to watch the flight of some bird. Suddenly the shadow of a great mountain peak came up from behind and shot in front of them. When the nurse saw it, she started and shook, and tremulously grasping the hand of the princess, turned and began to run down the hill. 
What's all the haste, Nursie? asked Irene, running alongside of her. We must not be out a moment longer. But we can't help being out in good many moments longer. It was too true. The nurse almost cried. They were much too far from home. It was against express orders to be out with the princess one moment after the sun was down, and they were nearly a mile up the mountain. If His Majesty, Irene's papa, were to hear of it, Ludie would certainly be dismissed, and to leave the princess would break her heart. It was no wonder she ran. But Irene was not in the least frightened, not knowing anything to be frightened at. She kept on chattering as well as she could, but it was not easy. Ludy, Ludy, why do you run so fast? It shakes my teeth when I talk. Then don't talk, said Ludy. But the princess went on talking. She was always saying, look, look, Ludy. But Ludy paid no more heed to anything she said, only ran on. Look, look, Ludy, don't you see that funny man peeping over the rock? Ludy only ran the faster. They had to pass the rock, and when they came nearer, the princess clearly saw that it was only a large fragment of the rock itself that she had mistaken for a man. Look, look, Ludy, there's such a curious creature at the foot of that old tree. Look at it, Ludy, it's making faces at us, I do think. Ludy gave a stifled cry and ran faster still, so fast that Irene's little legs could not keep up with her, and she fell with a clash. It was a hard downhill road, and as she began running very fast, so it was no wonder the princess began to cry. This put the nurse nearly beside herself, but all she could do was run on the moment she got the princess on her feet again. "'Who's that laughing at me?' said the princess, trying to keep in her sobs and running too fast for her grazed knees. "'Nobody, child!' said the nurse, almost angrily. But that instant there came a burst of course tittering from somewhere near, and a hoarse, indistinct voice that seemed to say, Lies! 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 Oh! cried the nurse with a sigh that was almost a scream, and ran on faster than ever. Nursey! Ludie! I can't run any more! Do let us walk a bit! What am I to do? said the nurse. Here, I will carry you. She caught her up but found her much too heavy to run with and had to set her down again. Then she looked wildly about her, gave a great cry, and said, We've taken the wrong turning somewhere, and I don't know where we are. We are lost, lost. The terror she was in had quite be bewildered her. It was true enough that they had lost the way. They had been running down into a little valley in which there was no house to be seen. Now Irene did not know what good reason there was for her nurse's terror, for the servants all had strict orders never to mention the goblins to her, but it was very discomposing to see her nurse in such a fright. Before, however, she had time to grow thoroughly alarmed like her, she heard the sound of whistling, and that revived her. Presently she saw a boy coming up the road from the valley to meet them. He was a whistler, but before they met, his whistling changed to singing. And this is something like what he sang. Ring, dod, bang, go the hammers clang, hit and turn and bore, whiz and puff and roar. Thus we rive the rocks, force the goblin locks, see the shining ore. One, two, three, bright as gold can be. Four, five, six, shovels, mattocks, picks. Seven, eight, nine, light your lamp at mine. Ten, eleven, twelve, Loosely hold the helve. We're the merry miner boys. Make the goblins hold their noise. I wish you would hold your noise, said the nurse rudely, for the very word goblin at such a time and in such a place made her tremble. It would bring the goblins upon them to a certainty, she thought, to defy them in that way. But whether the boy heard her or not, he did not stop his singing. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, this is worth the sifting. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, there's the match in Leighton. Nineteen, twenty, goblins in a plenty. Do be quiet, cried the nurse in a whispered shriek. But the boy, who was now close at hand, still went on. Hush, scush, scurry, there you go in a hurry. Gobble, gobble, goblin, there you go a wobbling. Hobble, hobble, hobblin, cobble, cobble, cobblin, hob, bob, goblin, huh. There, said the boy, 
as he stood so opposite them. There, that'll do for them. They can't bear singing and they can't stand that song. They can't sing themselves for they have no more voice than a crow and they don't like other people to sing. The boy was dressed in a miner's dress with a curious cap on his head. He was a very nice looking boy with eyes as dark as the mines in which he worked and as sparkling as the crystals in their rocks. He was about 12 years old. His face was almost too pale for beauty, which came of his being so little in the open air and the sunlight, for even vegetables grow in the dark are white, but he looked happy, merry indeed, perhaps at the thought of having routed the goblins, and his bearing as he stood before them had nothing clownish or rude about it. I saw them, he went on, as I came up, and I'm very glad I did. I knew they were after somebody, but I couldn't see who it was. They won't touch you so long as I'm with you. Why, who are you? asked the nurse, offended at the freedom with which he spoke to them. I'm Peter's son. Who's Peter? Peter the miner. I don't know him. I'm his son, though. And why should the goblins mind you, pray? Because I don't mind them. I'm used to them. What difference does that make? If you're not afraid of them, they're afraid of you. I'm not afraid of them, that's all. But it's all what's wanted, up here, that is. It's a different thing down there. They won't always mind that song even down there. And if anyone sings it, they stand grinning at him awfully. And if he gets frightened and misses a word or says a wrong one, they, oh, don't they give it to him. What do they do to him? Asked Irene with a trembling voice. Don't go frightening the princess, said the nurse. The princess, repeated the little miner, taking off his curious cap. I beg your pardon, but you oughtn't be out so late. Everybody knows that's against the law. Yes, indeed it is, said the nurse, beginning to cry again, and I shall have to suffer for it. What does that matter, said the boy? It must be your fault. It is the princess who will suffer for it. I hope they didn't hear you call her the princess. If they did, they're sure to know her again. They're awfully sharp. Ludy, Ludy, cried the princess. Take me home. Don't go on like that, said the nurse to the boy almost fiercely. How could I help it? I lost my way. You shouldn't have been out so late. You wouldn't have lost your way if you hadn't been frightened, said the boy. Come along, I'll soon set you right again. Sherry, shall I carry your little highness? Impertinence, murmured the nurse, but she did not say it aloud, for she thought if she made him angry, he might take his revenge by telling someone belonging to the house, and then it would be sure to come to the king's ears. No, thank you, said Irene. I can walk very well, though I can't run so fast as Nursie. If you will give me one hand, Ludie will give me another, and then I shall get on famously. They soon had her between them, holding a hand of each. Now let's run, said the nurse. No, no, said the little miner. That's the worst thing you can do. If you hadn't run before, you would have not lost your way. And if you run now, they will be after you in a moment. I don't want to run, said Irene. You don't think of me, said the nurse. Yes, I do, Ludy. The boy says they won't touch us if we don't run. Yes, but if they know at the house that I've kept you out so late, I shall be turned away, and that would break my heart. Turned away, Ludy? Who would turn you away? Your papa, child. But I'll tell him it was all my fault, and you know it was, Ludy. He won't mind that. I'm sure he won't. Then I'll cry, and I'll go down on my knees to him and beg him not to take away my dear old Ludy. The nurse was comforted at hearing this and said no more. They went on, walking pretty fast, but taking care not to run a step. I want you to, I want to talk to you, said Irene to the little miner, but it's so awkward. I don't know your name. My name's Curdie, little princess. What a funny name, Curdie. What more? Curdie Peterson. What's your name, please? Irene. What more? I don't know what more. What more is my name, Ludy? Princesses haven't got more than one name. They don't need it. Oh, then, Curdie, you must 
Just call me Irene, and no more. No, indeed, said the nurse indignantly. He shall do no such thing. What shall he call me then, Ludie? Your Royal Highness. My Royal Highness? What's that? No, no, Ludie, I will not be called names. I don't like them. You said to me once yourself that it's only rude children that call names, and I'm sure Curdy wouldn't be rude. Curdy, my name's Irene. Well, Irene, said Curdy, with a glance at the nurse, which showed he enjoyed teasing her, it's very kind of you to let me call you anything. I like your name very much. He expected the nurse to interfere again, but he soon saw that she was too frightened to speak. She was staring at something a few yards before them, in the middle of the path, where it narrowed between rocks so that only one could pass at a time. "'It's very much kinder of you to go out of your way to take us home,' said Irene. "'I'm not going out of my way yet,' said Curdie. "'It's on the other side of those rocks that the path turns off to my father's.' "'You wouldn't think of leaving a silver safe home, I'm sure.' gasped the nurse. Of course not, said Curdie. You dear, good, kind Curdie. I'll give you a kiss when we get home, said the princess. The nurse gave her a great pull by the hand she held, but at that instant the something in the middle of the way, which had looked like a great lump of earth brought down by the rain, began to move. One after another it shot out four long things, like two arms and two legs, but it was now too dark to tell what they were. The nurse began to tremble from head to foot. Irene clasped Curdie's hand yet closer, and Curdie began to sing again. One, two, hit and hew, three, four, blast and bore, five, six, there's a fix, seven, eight, hold it straight, nine, ten, hit again, hurry, scurry, bother, smother, there's a toad in the road, smash it, squash it, fry it, dry it, you're another, up and off, there's enough, huh. As he uttered the last words, Curdy let go of his companion and rushed at the thing in the road, as if he would trample it under his feet. It gave a great spring and ran straight up one of the rocks like a huge spider. Curdy turned back laughing and took Irene's hand again. She grasped it very tight, but said nothing till they had passed the rocks. A few yards more and she found herself on a part of the road she knew and was able to speak again. Do you know, Curdy? I don't quite like your song. It sounds to me rather rude, she said. Well, perhaps it is, answered Curdie. I never thought of that. It's a way we have. We do it because they don't like it. Who don't like it? The cobs, as we called them. Don't, said the nurse. Why not, said Curdie. I beg you won't. Please don't. Oh, if you ask me that way, of course I won't though I don't a bit know why. Look, there are the lights of your great house down below. You'll be at home in five minutes now. Nothing more happened. They reached home in safety. Nobody had missed them or even known they had gone out, and they arrived at the door belonging to their part of the house without seeing them. The nurse was rushing in with a hurried and not over gracious good night to Curdie, but the princess pulled her hand from him her hand from hers, and was just throwing her arms around Curdie's neck when the nurse caught her again and dragged her away. Ludi, Ludi, I promised Curdie a kiss, cried Irene. A princess mustn't give it kisses. It's not at all proper, said Ludi. But I promised, said the princess. There's no occasion. He's only a minor boy. He is a good boy and a brave boy, and he has been very kind to us, Ludi. Ludi, I promised. Then you shouldn't have promised. Ludie, I promised him a kiss. Your Royal Highness, said Ludi, suddenly growing very respectful, must come in directly. Nurse, a princess must not break her word, said Irene, drawing herself up and standing stock still. Ludi did not know which the king might count the worst, to let the princess be out after sunset or to let her kiss the minor boy. She did not know that, being a gentleman, as many kings have been, he would have counted neither of them the worse. However much he might have disliked his daughter to kiss the minor boy, he would not have had her break her word for all the goblins in creation. But, as I say, the nurse was not lady enough to understand this, and so she was in a great difficulty, 
for, if she insisted, someone might hear the princess cry and run to see, and then all would come out. But here, Curdie came again to the rescue. Never mind, Princess Irene, he said. You mustn't kiss me tonight, but you shall not break your word. I will come another time. You may be sure I will. Oh, thank you, Curdie, cried the princess and stopped crying. Good night, Irene. Good night, Ludy, said Curdie and turned and was out of sight in a moment. I should like to see him, muttered the nurse as she carried the princess to the nursery. You will see him, said Irene. You may be sure Curdie will keep his word. He's sure to come again. I should like to see him, repeated the nurse and said no more. She did not want to open a new cause of strife with the princess by saying more plainly what she meant. Glad enough that she had succeeded both in getting home on scene and in keeping the princess from kissing the miner's boy, she resolved to watch her far better in future. Her carelessness had already doubled the danger she was in. Formerly, the goblins were her only fear. Now she had to protect her charge from Curdie as well. Thanks for joining me for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of The Princess and the Goblin by George MacDonald. Until then, thanks for listening, and good night.